Tonight's program, An Evening with Neil Shepard and Peggy Sapphire. I was pleased to be able to meet them both at um, Birch Song event that we had last September, which was a wonderful day in September, a beautiful day with 17 or so poets reading their work, and um, I, I'd love to be able to do something like that again sometime in the near future. Neil has published um, a chapbook of poems called Vermont Exit Ramps, uh, Big Table Publishing in 2012, as well as five full collections of poetry, S Scavenging the Country for a Heartbeat, First Book Award, Midlist Press in 1993, I'm Here Because I Lost My Way, Midlist 1998, This Far from the Source, Midlist 2006, Travel Untravel, Midlist 2011, and most recently, Hominid Up, Salmon Poetry Press, 2015. Um, the new book, Vermont Exit Ramps 2, is a full collection of poems and photographs that will be published by a collaboration of a Green Writers Press, Sundog Press, in this fall. It should be coming out. His poems and essays appear in several hundred magazines and online publications, including Poem A Day from the Academy of American Poets. He's been nominated several times for the Pushcart Prize. Neil has been a fellow at the McDonald Arts Colony, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, uh, Centre d'Art Marne in France, and Tyrone Guthrie Arts Center in Ireland, um, and you were just there recently. You're a busy man. <laughs> he has founded and directed for eight years the writing program at the Vermont Studio Center. Hayden Carruth has said this of scavenging the country for a heartbeat, your first book? Neil Shepard's first book in his event of encouragement to me. In the low-voiced eloquence of his meditative lyrics, I find no artifice, no pretension, or faddishness, but instead clarity of mind and heart and honesty of technique. Moreover, in all these poems, Shepard brings us an astonishing originality of imagery, objects we had never thought of before. To read these poems is an awakening. I hope it comes to many readers. He currently splits his time between Vermont and New York City, where he teaches poetry workshops at the Poets' House and is a core faculty in the low res res residency MFA writing program at Wilkes University. Outside of the literary realm, realm Neil is a founding member of the jazz poetry group PoJazz. I love that. Peggy Sapphire has written two books of poetry, A Possible Explanation, Partisan Press, 2006, In the End, A Circle, Antrim House, 2009. She's the co-editor of the book, The Disenfranchised, Stories of Life and Grief When an Ex-Spouse Dies, Baywood Publishing Company, Incorporated, 2013. She has been in numerous journals, including Connecticut River Review, Flipside, the country and abroad, and many others. She is, <laughs> her poems have been, and I'm having a hard time reading. They have been anthologized in The Circle Continues in his free press, Poets Against the War, Thunder's Mouth Nation Books, Hurricane Blues, Poems About Katrina and Rita, Southeast Missouri State University Press, Anthology of New England Writers in 01 and 06. Her short fiction has appeared in the Underwood Review. She has served on the Board of Trustees for the Frost Place, Franconia, New Hampshire, and as editor of the Connecticut River Review, published by Connecticut Poetry Society. Um, April Osman, poetry consultant for Atrium House Press, and I quote, has said this about Peggy. Whether considering death or lust, abuse, shame, family, love, grief, or acceptance, Peggy Sapphire's intimate conversational poems are sassy, tender, and sexy all at once, turning a wry eye on American culture and embracing the good, bad, ugly, and beautiful alike, wise in the maturity and compassion of a fully lived life. Reading these poems is like meeting a lifelong friend for a gourmet meal and catching up, pull up a chair and prepare to make a new friend. 
Peggy and her husband, Robert Feinberg, designed and built their home in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, two miles up a dirt road, and three to the nearest country store. I welcome both of you. Who would like to read first tonight? Peggy, thank you so much for coming. Thank you all for being here. Really is always much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> I have my little list of what I was going to read, and I'm going to add one more to it for Kate, Neil's wife, because I just learned that she uh, is working on a book, I believe, uh, having to do with food and language. And I just happen to have one poem um, written um, uh, with my aunt in mind, a wonderful woman who came out of her, you know, railroad apartment on the Lower East Side with scrumptious meals and, on Sundays. It was a thrill. Anyway, this is called Steamy Sundays. She's dead now but not from too much chopped liver. It's dripping dollops of schmaltz with eggs, mashed, plenty of salt and onions wilted in butter. No, Aunt Ida not only thrived on old country recipes, she nourished us all those Sunday afternoons ago with Yiddish and kasha. Her dining room oval in full leaf, overflowing her Houston Street living room whose Lower East Side casements faced a billboard, a movie billboard, announcing simmering island lust, Jane Russell's sumptuous amidst sweet pineapples as her bare-chested lover's cigarette smoldered along with the rest of him, Jane's bosom spilling over the edge of her crimson bodice like coconuts on a slender palm. I served Aunt Ida's porcelain overflowing with Niagara's of pot roast and kugel, and I knew Aunt Ida had been loved in a tropical way. Okay, this is a poem which clearly was written some years back, but um, there's a, to me, a kind of a moral dilemma about how um, I would and how we all need to think about, I think we need to think about how to talk to children about um, our climate, our earth, and so on. In the bleak. In the bleak of my eye lives a perhaps of how the story ends. In the scream between dream and nightmare, in the flinch of hope, wrestling with despair. My child is born, and I rush to wrap my warmth around her, let flow my milk and mothering, recite rhymes of simpler times, when diddles played fiddles and sheep came home, and little girls wore petticoats when tumbling down hills was the worst thing that could happen. How to and where to speak the words of change and doom, of crocus and daffodils that may never bloom, because seasons are changing their names, because spring rarely arrives and summer stays too long. Do I tell her of my childhood springtimes, of greens briefly gold, my arms delighted, barely cold? Do I tell her to dream? Yes, but hurry. Okay, this is basically a love poem to my husband. Now that you know we built our home. He was the, he was the builder and I was the Sherpa, you know. This is called Hereafter. I've sworn I'll leave this place when you are gone. Let me be clear, when I must survive without you, climb our stairs, walk our floor, when, our hand, when my hands must close our front door or open it with unnatural hope, they will hold your hands. When I look up, it will be as if you reside in the hemlock, B 
beams sanded free of splinters, chamfered and lamb-tongued. I will remember wood shavings, wood dusting your beard and my long hair. Neither of us able to see past our glasses. Through the many windows whose light I had to have, I'll see our blue spruce doubled, even tripled, but never enough to give shade, another wild hope. So what, we shrugged, we've got our wild apple trees, generous with Max every September, ready for apple saucing, peel and all. Your day of coring, cutting and stirring, portioning, labeling and freezing. In winter, the season of water falling like stones upon my lips. Finches and nuthatches will be longing too, awaiting your faithful replenishing of black oil seeds and suet. I won't manage their grief and mine. Upstairs in the library you invented, our shelves cut from local kingdom pine, I would have to face titles of volumes lugged from borrowed basements, our former homes, rented rooms, one last time. But there will always be mornings of southeast sun, honey light in the afternoons, lupin will seed themselves, our rosa rugosas will never need pampering, that was our plan. Lilies on their own, clustered and weathering with masses of mallow daisies and black eyes. Our stone path hemmed in every space by creeping thyme and myrtle, as if we'd known they'd also find their way. Best to leave them to their destinies, as I will be. All promises kept, circles fully rounded. Okay. In this book. Um, I come from a, um, a family where social justice and politics and dinner table conversations were our diet. And I find that in my poetry. It came that way. Can't be helped. And this is called Not Yet. I miss you tonight. Someone's talking about her day-to-day -day of bills she can't pay, unuseless, uh, unless she shorts her landlord or her kids' dinner plates. How she sings the anthem of this land to her kids. But the words don't speak of poverty for their floor-mopping father, for their janitor mother. Don't speak in new language the fears of getting sick and then sicker. I miss you tonight. I know you'd be here with me, listening to this woman tell her story of growing up on land her parents worked all their sharecropper lives. She walks in different shoes. Their road is her road now. Turns out being free hasn't made a difference. Tonight a man gathers his voice from all those still resounding until it's everything we breathe. It stands us up, clear out of our seats and our legs don't ache from years of building roads and cleaning other people's bathrooms, being on time, wearing a uniform, being silent. This man is calling to us. He reminds us we're all people of color. We say, uh, it reminds us of the women sleeping cold and fetal in their layers of dirty clothes. We say sleeping, but we don't know. We just hope, because sleep doesn't hurt. He tells us of hungry kids having breakfast in school instead of at their kitchen table. Those same kids on the corner hoping we'll drop a dollar, but we're not really sure it's hunger we see. We're so smart. Could be a different craving the streets feed them. When school gives up before she can read or makes choices before she flips those tassels, smartly striding down the aisle in a rented black robe, I hear this man calling us now, pulling me to my old feet once again. I'm crying from these same brown eyes you gave me, still the child you'd put to bed whispering, don't be dreaming the grass is greener on the other side. 
teaching me to sing union songs of fair wages and workers needing jobs, of union maids never afraid and cardboard rooftops caving in. I miss you tonight. They're still singing their songs, your songs. They're telling me to work, to walk further, to sing louder, teach the words to my kids 50 years later and how many more to go. Things aren't bad enough. This is a poem for, I wrote for Ruby D. Uh, when her husband, Ossie Davis, passed away. It's called 56 Years. We heard your words, Ruby. He was good material to work with, you said. And we all saw him look across to you that night, smiling. Those brown eyes had held you for more than a century. Countless velvet curtains had parted before you. His baritone words soaring beyond the dim, mind, uh, dim lights of whites only minds. To brave friends marching, praying, standing in solidarity. What can possibly be your reward now? To know that by every compass reading, he was fully round the circles of struggle. That all he had to do when all he could do was sleep more deeply, was take in one last of this world and wait. There was no life but the one with you, unto you, unto yourselves. This, the rest of us now are wanting, wanting to say or sing, to give or bring, to help you breathe deeply without him, to come home without him, to sleep until you sleep again with him. You wait, he waits, you know. This next is um, written uh, with thoughts of my father who was a, <clears throat> a fisherman through and through. Uh, when he lost his sight, um, he knew where to go anyway and how to get there. So this is called Handing Down Secrets. She straddles the shallows, one leg pushing off, the other stretching into her father's John boat as it slices the mirror lake. They're on their way. The daughter captaining, her blind father navigating, his seeing memory faithful as a compass, his wooden oars worn, rounded by the uh, his hands and eight decades of his weather. He delivers them to the secret birthing rooms of freshwater bass. Her silence like his, they drift above tool, uh, dark, cool recesses of sunken branches, grassy reflections barely swaying with each melting edge of rippled water. He whispers of telling time by light and shadow, of memories echoing and the resonance of clear water, of the history told by rounded stones and centuries of trees turned to peat. She turns them homeward. He names it a circle. Uh, I've brought some poems which haven't been published. Hopefully it'll happen. I, mean, I haven't sent them out. Uh, I've been holding on, um, which is what I do for a while, right? <laughs> and actually, this one was um, inspired by the um, by by my fellow when I was at the Vermont Studio Center. I had a, a fellowship there for a month, and um, they've set it up for writers so that every, each and every uh, studio room faces the Guion River. And so this is for that river, Guion River, Vermont. The river Guion is hushed this morning, for no living thing is as merciful as silent forgiveness. Guion lets go of all grievances here, even against those who would hold her back. As was tried near Jerusalem before Solomon was king, Guion slaked the thirst of any parched souls, 
even Assyrian marauders who massed above the city. They could not stop her from delivering her life-giving waters. It was Hezekiah who knew the better course and fashioned a tunnel stone by stone underground with his workmen, and the Gion was reborn to the city of David, where she fed the pool of Siloam and rushed to anoint Solomon king. Gion runs today from Vermont's own Eden, as she has since the days of that first garden, I'll never wander. One of four sisters I'll never meet, the Euphrates, Pizan, the Tigris. Gion abides with them as I breathe here, living as she does, as she goes beyond my window, cleansed as she leaves me, but not abandoned. I, um, perhaps you heard it, um, Terry Gross, quite a while back, interviewed Maurice Sendak in his home uh, when he could no longer get out and around. This is written for him. The man who knows where the wild things are. Live your life, live your life, live your life, he says. One farewell is not enough from the 83-year-old man to the young woman who visits. I cry a lot, he says. Misses his brother, Jack. Eugene, his love of 50 years, both gone on without him. It's the worst of isolations, he says. Still, each day is worth the struggle. He trusts his companion who saves his daily life. I'm not done yet, he says. Images appear in dreams, rescue and deliver him from himself. His drawing board carries him the rest of the way. There is no afterlife, he knows. He's a prophet now. His brother waits. They will be boys together again. Um, okay. This is called, um, I, I, I'm trying to recall, how did I even get there? It just came to, you know, sometimes a line, a thought just comes. And the one that I came to me was the noblest of fruits, which is the name of the poem. She was the apple of his eye. That's why some, day, some say he went blind. If not by eye, then by mind. It's true she was first to eat the apple, but think, who needlessly climbed the tree since the apple hadn't fallen far? All Eve wanted was a single bite, not of a dozen green apples, it is written, so generously proffered. It was simply the kiss, the kiss she longed for, the single kiss of the noblest of fruits. Myopic Adam sought forbidden fruits, while Eve merely wished to keep the healer away. To go back before the days of apple, cheese, and wine, how sublime then. Adam, warrior of the two, sought revolution. He forced the apple to fall before its time, leaving one less for the rest of us on the tree of knowledge. Eve, wiser of the two, awaited a true friend, one who might offer a common pebble, but from whose affectionate hand that pebble would become an apple, the very same that later grew on Frostian trees, trees that would not trespass stone fences between himself and his good neighbor. If only Eve had been blessed by a parish of good neighbors or friendly savages whose untamed palates found wild apples more to their liking than cultivated peaches. Instead, she failed to inquire of the dark core beneath the succulents, could not believe that within her lover's charms her eternal foe resided. Perhaps then the cart knight would not have been upset by the ensuing turmoil between herself and the other sentient being in that Eden place we've learned to call the garden. Okay. 
Um, this, as they say in the movies, is, was inspired by a true event. This is called One Evening After Dinner. Half dressed, but so what? Down the wooden porch steps, my life is full out on the flagstone. Bobby's glasses flung into the bushes, but otherwise, he's as always, except that his eyes are closed, except that he's mumbling, but he is mumbling. And I look to our son, and all he can tell me is that dad was fine. We were out here talking, walking, he blacked out, no sound, knees buckled, but his head on stone. Louder but louder was our son, dad, oh dad, the two of us now twins in a crouch. What happened, I ask, what happened? Bobby doesn't know a thing, he's no help, no blood anywhere, but wasting no time, his swelling forehead, his swelling cheekbone, now a pillow for his head, a blanket for the rest of him, now looking straight into my eyes, he knows me. His blue eyes so wide. What happened, he murmurs. You tell me, I want to insist. Our son and I read each other's mind. Has this ever happened before? No, but he's 74. Well, I guess he needs, we need, 911. We should, but wait, let's not panic. Bobby wouldn't like that. Still with his blues, scanning, we are prophets now, my son and I, chanting, you're going to be fine, just like paramedics on TV. Because if you're not, if this is it, if this is what it looks like, if it's our turn on this one way downhill, if I can't make this gone, if you don't throw off the blanket and laugh and shake your head and make us laugh, at ourselves, if we don't keep going till the clock we do believe in ticks one last. I haven't kept track of my time, but I'm going to read one more. Okay, is that okay? <laughs> this is uh, called Afterwards. Look for me in the woods in old growths of pines, or beneath the last 50 years of maple leaves. I've made my peace with rain, frost. My nakedness wears like moss, still sweaty with August sun. September rain, solitary nights, flights of owls, loons skimming the lake where we floated. By day, you and I, our voices private, hovering above us. I'll be waiting near the maidenhair ferns, but not among them. They are virgins, and I am not. I'll be listening for leaves beneath your feet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice poems, yeah. And we could have used you uh, at the Vermont Studio Center many years ago when I in, was directing and invited Hayden Carruth, um, to, and he was, came in to give a craft talk, and he said to the assembled group, there's nothing I can tell you. <laughs> and he said, you know, do you know the name of the river outside of this window and no one knew the name and he said it's one of it's the name of one of the four rivers of paradise if you don't know the name of one of the four rivers of paradise i have nothing to tell you and no one knew that it was the gihon the gihon and yeah so he got up and he walked out and i had to rush out after him and say we paid you to 
anyway, he came back in, he delivered a brilliant lecture, but he, he was, you know, he could be cantankerous, irascible, was that day. Had you been there, you would have told him. Oh, yes. The Gihon, of course. Thanks uh, for coming out, and thanks, Sharer, for setting this up. Um, I'm going to read um, from my new book, Hominid Up, and it takes place both in New York, where I live half the year, and in Vermont, where I live the other half. And so I'll start with the urban poems and then move to the poems of Vermont. And I'll start with the title poem, Hominid Up. Hominids are, of course, us, Homo sapiens sapiens, and all of the uh, the forms before us, our ancestral cousins, all now extinct, going back to you know Lucy, Australopithecus, and others, and we have either evolved or devolved from that time. Uh, this is a fairly dark book politically, so you, you get my sense perhaps that we've devolved more than evolved. But in any case, I'll read the title poem called "Hominid Up." I am a world-class insomniac, and this is a poem about being up late at night and writing um, in that space of insomnia. Hominid up. I write at night when the old hominid climbs up to the highest branch of the brain and crouches there in a leafy crotch, listening to the night sound snarling below his heart outracing the big cats of the savanna. He's glad I'm civilized and live indoors, far from the tooth and claw. Glad my central plumbing works, my TP dispenser full, so he doesn't have to shit off a limb. And though he loves roosting with birds, the wind rocking him, talking through the mouths of leaves, he loves also how the birds have been stuffed into the softest down pillows where he may lay his head and dream. Dreams are scarce as water holes where he's from. One eye always open for danger, one for hunger. We're kin for sure. The old beast in me sleeps lightly or barely sleeps. I wake often and watch him scratch himself with a twig that could pass for a pencil, or poke at a moonlit line of ants that resembles this scratched pentameter. Some nights, we almost meet at a forking branch where he chooses silence, and I, this speech. And so this next poem is, uh, takes place in, in Manhattan. It's called At the Corner of Broadway in 105th. And it was written soon after I moved to uh, the city about six, seven years ago now. And I was, you know, a rube in the city. I didn't even know what a kneeling bus was, which is, you know, the buses that lower themselves by an air suspension system to let uh, wheelchairs deploy. Okay, that's important to this poem. At the corner of Broadway and 105th, a voice said, can you help me? And being new to the city, I turned to the man twisted against his walker, spittle on his lip, sweaty snarls of hair against his forehead. Can you help me? And he pointed to the unstable wheels of his walker, the whole contraption of it. I stopped to help him cross the street, but no, I'm sick with HIV. I need a cab to Beth Israel Hospital. And he showed me an ID card to prove his claim. And he showed me $6 in his hand. And Beth Israel was way downtown, another 10 or $20 away. And would I help him? I could almost hear the hiss of a kneeling bus like a great elephant or camel lowering itself to let the lesser one ride. But I knew nothing of roots and caravans and shepherding him forward. I could hear the subways whoosh and rattle beneath us, but those long stairs downward. And I could see the lively yellow cabs glowing vacant up and down the avenue. I'm not kidding, buddy, I really need help. And the more my mind considered how he'd arrived here 
with a broken wheel and where he'd been going in the first place, the more I said, no, no, I can help you across the street and no further. And I saved 20 bucks and I wasn't suckered, but later I felt a swindler's pride as if I had cheated him of his valuables. And later still, my mind hit a black mood and I felt a long gray trunk reach down and lift me up and look at me with ancient eyes and squeeze the life out of me and put me down again and give me a little nudge homeward with its withered trunk. I get to use both waters, maybe. That's okay. I only need one. <laughs> you took the other. So I've written several sort of poems um, about uh, encounters on the street. I'll read one other. This one I like more for its sound than its sense, I think. Woman crossing Broadway at 106th. There's a woman crossing Broadway against the light. Dark skinned, she's wearing a white summer dress, one of two New York colors on a summer's day, the other color black, equally sexy and chic, but night savvy, and now it's midday. So she's wearing white, smoking a cigarette, clicking along in high heels, casual as the solstice day is long. The day is dark. Lines of thunderstorms covering the sun, one darker than the next, making up their own rules of light, sparking the air from within a black turbulence. On the avenue, a mess of mangled umbrellas, blouses doused to diaphanous surprise, breasts or bras revealed. Her high heels hobble her a little, Umbrella-less, she lets the rain arrange her hair, mascara, dimple her padded shoulders. She crosses amidst, amidst a burst of thunderbolts, ground strokes making the street lights crackle. Gutters gurgle in the downbursts. A few wan, wet pedestrians dash past her, splashing her thighs. She seems to rise higher in the crossing, holding her cigarette straight out, as if there were a line between raindrops, a beam she could follow, a thin wire of sure pleasure she could walk across to the other side. Um, as Shara mentioned, I perform sometimes with a group called Po Jazz, Poetry and Jazz Ensemble, and sometimes as many as 10-piece band, other times just a trio. Um, and um, we perform around Vermont, so look for us, po jazz. Um, I'm going to read a po jazz kind of poem, and I was thinking about reading it because uh, it's about Wayne Shorter, and Wayne Shorter, if you went to the Jazz Fest, you, you know that he headlined um, the festival starting last Friday, and um, he was, at, I think, 82 years old at this point, and still a, with a wonderful band, and uh, still a real space shot of a human being, you know, sort of very disconnected in his, his speech, but, um, you know, brilliant at the same time. So this is called Wayne and Bud, and the time frame for this is when he was brand spanking new. He, this was 1959, and when he was uh, a young uh, saxophonist, uh, and at the beginning of his career and playing in the Miles Davis band with uh, Bud Powell, fan, the great pianist, who was sort of nearing the end of his drug-addicted career. And they sort of met in, this, in the Miles Davis band. And I heard this story, Shorter told it to Terry Gross um, on All Fresh Air, and I pulled over to the side of the road and started trying to write the poem based on what he said. And there's only one word, Budo. It's a tune that uh, Bud Powell wrote, and they used to play in the band, Budo. Wayne and Bud. Hip new kid on the bandstand, Wayne Shorter, way back in 59, already thoughtful and silent, and when he spoke, he spoke no evil, just words of cosmic good, insane one-liners, so spaced they needed warp speed to connect. 
Or if he didn't speak, he played those smart interstellar phrasings from soprano sax, brass ear concatenations from tenor. And that first night, Wayne on the bandstand with lithe Miles, Paul Chambers, Jimmy Cobb, and a glazed Bud Powell at the keyboards. Bud just gazed, gazed off as Wayne chorused. After the gig, well along in his addictions, Powell stumbled to Wayne's digs. A slight arpeggio against the door. Wayne opened and in walked Bud, straight past him, crashed in a chair and just stared, stared hard. Then to Wayne's, what's up? Said, play me that thing you played tonight on Budo. And Wayne played it again, but never the same, so he made it jump again. And Bud just said, uh-huh, and walked out. And seven lean years later, toward the end of his swooning pianissimo, Bud finally told him, I was just checking to see if jazz would be okay after I'm gone, and it will be, but oh. And then he checked out. I'll read one more jazz poem, and I usually start with this one because uh, it's called, This is a Test, Can You Hear Me? And it's a good way to sucker people into you know, participation. So. This is a test, can you hear me? This is a test, can you hear me? This is a test, a call of distress, can you hear me? This is the blues, the rhythms I choose, can you hear me? This is the blues, my baby, my baby and my baby, they all done me wrong, they all gone away, can you hear me? I know you got your heartache, I can hear you, I know you got your troubles way down in your shoes. I do too. I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? This is a test. You're going to take it too. Going to feel bluer than blue, lower than low down. Can you hear me? I'm at that age when the woman I loved with raven hair has a head of gray. When the one with the perfect pear breasts has rotten nectar, a bee sting, a cancer when her pearl of a smile shines at night from a water glass, when that piece of ass is now just a piece of a more comprehensive ass. Can you hear me? I'm at that age when love says, put up or shut up, get it up or put it down. I'm talking that deepest down thing, love when the body's gone, love with the blonde washed out, the blue rinsed in, that's the blues lovers choose. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? This is a test. You're going to take it, too. After which, my wife usually kicks me in the shin. But I read it every time. OK. I think I'll read one more poem from this section. Um, it's an Obama poem um, back, <laughs> it's called Election Day in uh, Nelson County, Virginia, uh, November 4th, 2008, his first uh, win. And uh, I remember canvassing for him in Vermont, we didn't need to, canvassing for him in New Hampshire, and then I was uh, going down to an art colony uh, in Virginia, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and I just happened to be there during the home stretch. Nelson County had never voted for a Democrat before, and certainly had never voted for a black man. And so I worked with the Democrats, and uh, the, you know, the racism was just bracing. But nevertheless, uh, Nelson County did go for Obama. And as we know, he, he won many things. But this was on election day itself, when it was just the push to get out the vote on the very day of the election. Door hanging is what they called it at headquarters. Take a flyer, take a partner, take precaution. We drove down a crumbling hilltop road called Main Street, kudzu creeping over the tar. Broken shacks, trailers with buckled roofs, yards buried in trash. Off the spine of Main Street, roads collapsed in weedy paths, 
spilling east to the sixth lane, west to the floodplain. Houses with no doorknobs, no doors, nothing from which to hang the blue sign promising change. Yet each had a glowing keep out sign and a couple of snarling dogs. If I saw it this way, it was the way I was raised to see it. Forgive me if we didn't visit every home, hang the sign on every knob, saying we'd been there and wanted their vote because it meant a lot to their future. Watching a few kids listless on the stairs, I could see how far we'd let them fall. Got some spare change they spat without looking up. They were locked in, and the best intentions of a black man in a white house would not spring them. The beautiful words of the orator would not translate into language explaining our blue hanging sign on the door, vote for change, nor their orange reply, keep out. Another hopeful poem of the, of the morning. Okay, um, I'm gonna shift to some poems from the Vermont part of the book. And I'm gonna start with a little one called um, A Little Corny. And it's a poem for Hayden Carruth, um, whose writing shack I used for a year uh, long after he had moved on to New York State, but his uh, second wife, Rose Marie Carruth, still lived there. And um, I was in between places, as we say, and she kindly let me use uh, Hayden Shack, and it was very cool, kind of full of his you know, temperament and, and lineation and everything else. Um, and in this poem, uh, two people show up. Um, Wes McNair, who's uh, a wonderful poet in um, Maine, and uh, Sebastian Matthews, um, a great poet um, whose, de whose dad was William Matthews, Bill Matthews. And both of them loved Hayden Carruth. And so when I was there, they came to annoy me and visit me. So, OK. A little corny. I'm back in Hayden's writing shack, irascible and uncharitable as Hayden, when work's waylaid by unplanned visitations. I'm chatting with Wes McNair and Sebastian Matthews, trading stories instead of writing poems about Carruth, his several lines of work in Johnson, Vermont, gardening and haying, repairing Marshall Washer's tractor or baler, milking cows and mucking out stalls, banging out a writer's hack words, nickel per word, review after review, after which finally came the snow sober or spring drunk poems. Then we walked the quarter mile to Hayden's old meadow, a lovely little piece of land by an oxbow on Foot Brook, where Hayden used to garden and tend his apple trees. Several thick barked old ones are blooming now, alive with bees. Wes and Sebastian lean in and part the blossom from the sting, gather bouquets from the brookside trees, from what might have been Hayden-inspired blossoms honorifics to a man who would have said, said, hell and cunctation, that's as corny as roses and a patch of marigolds to keep the bugs from busting up the vegetables. No sentimentalist Hayden. And yet he was, wasn't he? When you read his love poems. Mm. Yeah. Okay, this next poem uh, is called Excoriating Ghosts. Um, and it's a summer solstice poem. I, I thought I'd choose a bunch of poems set in the spring and summer season at the end. And um, we, uh, just after the time um, of using Hayden's shack, we were building a house on a hillside in Johnson, Vermont. Um, and this is about that time. And excoriate uh, means uh, to uh, flay someone, criticize someone harshly, but it also means to uh, strip the flesh from the skin, or in this case, to uh, core the bark from a tree. Um, these deer were doing that to my apples. Okay, excoriating ghosts. June is consuming, stripping down darkness to its thinnest hours, swallowing sleep. Not the fireflies, not the moon, not the deer stripping apple trees, not the cemetery stones beyond them 
are as ravenous for my wakefulness. First light in the Harvard landscaper comes to plan dawn mem memories for this place, a past you'd have planted had you lived here last century, he said. So, apple rose, lone maple in the field, low stone walls along the meadow's fringe, and were it possible, the whole site tinted in daguerreotype. By noon, the brass knocker, brilliant sunlight, and Waldo, the town's oldest drunk and bricklayer, whose chimneys are guaranteed, he says, to outlast him. A hundred years ago, says Waldo, your land was town center. Those crossroads outside your door, the hub, Ben Ober and Cemetery Roads. Ben Ober, the most feared logger in the county, but his industry kept the townsmen alive until they died and went down the other road to the plot cemetery, just there, just there beyond the apples. A yep, too many bugs down by the river, so folks moved higher up where the breezes kept them only half crazy from black flies. And right there on the corner stood a general store, he says. A, a tall farmhouse next door, two barns, three outbuildings. And that farmhouse stood until the Second World War called those farm boys away and returned them so lazy, we bore them straight to the cemetery over there, the honored dead of Johnson, Vermont. By 10 o'clock twilight, Waldo fits the last brick picks up his pay, snorts at the Ivy Leaguer's plans, and scrams, shouting back, the winds are so big here, the last house lasted only 30 years, but my chimney's still standing. Anyway, thanks for the drinking money. So this land's been spoken for, and Waldo's words are stronger than any surviving chimney, the kind that usually says a home tumbled or burned once stood here. His words opened the past, welcomed the ghosts, and made it too late for dreaming moan corridors through high grass and pasture rooms where a picnicking family with a thatched basket of blue cheese and Chablis might spread its blanket and make its ample table. No, June says, join the night thinning between one day and another. Join the stories older than yours, in which the night deer coring the apples and stripping the trees come forward as excoriating ghosts whose harsh breaths say shame or live when the wind comes up and blow what's left of the plot cemetery's breath into these fields. I'll read a couple more. This one is called The Perch. I, too, hate the stately in my double row of pines that line the county road and slope down from the icy crest of Clay Hill to the iced falls of Footbrook. And I detest the bend of birch and poplar bowing under stiff winds from the cliffs of Laraway, enormous white hems of snow sweeping regally around North Pasture and those mossy escutcheon embroidered on every boundary stone or ancient crab apple marking the divisions of an estate. I can almost see the question mark in a red squirrel's tail or its black eye regarding me, its mouth full of cold apple or the mocking curtsy and the blue jay's bob as it plunders the winter fruit. Yes, I hate the stately, the bowing and the scraping, but I do own this affection for higher places, perches toward which the crows return at the day's end, winter flocks straggling back in ragged threes and fives, until a hundred strong they gather in the pines beyond my home for warmth as northern lights shimmer stained glass colors against a high black vault. And later, in the Earth's rotation, the spinning signet hand of eastern light wakes the crows and sends them sailing off in black armadas toward the day's ordinary treasures. Here's a little poem for these 
creatures we all know, cluster flies. Mm. You have them? I remember interviewing um, Galway Cannell once, going to his place in Glover, waiting for him to get out of the tub, talking to his son, Fergus. And there were just you know hundreds and hundreds of cluster flies. And so when he got out, he said, got a lot of cluster flies. And he said, what are they? <laughs> OK. Cluster flies clustering in the cool of autumn all day brazenly sunning on the gray clabberds of my home. They squeeze in towards sundown, under screen, through window seam, so tight black magic couldn't crack it. My white walls blacken with them. My lights burn with their buzzing. The unevolved eye in my brain tracks them like omens. The house will grow smaller, the sun porch dark with their slaughter, to be vacuumed with the dust, swept up like leaves, or laughed at. Their stupid back spins in an oblong of sunlight, dozing in a cold half world at the mercy of every creature who will deny them spring. A couple more. Unlike Bobby, who's a great builder, I'm terrible at these things. This is called fix the damn door. Fix the damn door. That goddamn hinge has squealed like an unlubricated pig since summer. All it takes is, I have neither the language nor the skill to tell you what it takes. Those hinges, flanges, double hung things, those brass concatenations holding the bolts or whatever the metal locked in those squeaky clasps. Spray it with WD-40. Spray away every goddamn problem. I must learn to fix it, that damn thing squealing all night because I cannot stop it. So it squeals and squeals as if in my head unwilling to be reasoned with, just piercing me all night as I stumble from desk to bed and bed to desk, that door squealing in or out of my imaginings. I imagine Gary Snyder fixing his leaky roof by moving a single board. What a Zen guy. Can I be that mindful, master the squeaky broken piece of machinery? Fix the damn door, the complaint, heart-wrenching, each time I stagger in and out all night at a loss for words, hankering. Two more uh, small ones. This one is after um, the Chinese poet Dao Shen. It's called Daystar, which is, of course, our sun. Right. Daystar. By noon, my back hurts in a good way. Shovel soil, heave rock, rake manure. Clarify the day star with a hoe. Black flies, deer flies. So the day goes, my shadow moving beside me. Squash mounds, carrot rows. Pie tins bang their stakes. Birds scatter. Wind, sun, cloud, Sun, wind, late day, the moon is a sickle, a ladle, a smile. Later, my back hurts worse. Soon enough, I'll be done with hurting. For now, let the day star brighten each object, rock, squash, man, and keep it from its shadow. And I'll end with a poem, it's a kind of poetics poem, um, called Blackfly Poetics. The way a black fly egg spawned on rock near fast moving water becomes the larva spiraling out, rolling over the edge from its airy world into the roiling cold and takes an air bubble down, down, where it becomes its next best self, clinging like a piece of green moss to a watery bottom stone, cold time washing its globed home until time bursts the pupil sac 
and it rides that dome of air to the surface and dries its wings. Well, that's how I go about it. Thought spawned by whatever comes into focus, leaf or stone, frozen for a moment from the swirl of what goes by. Then I roll over the edge into the swirl, the undesirable cold outside of time and space, the underside of matter where it starts to effervesce. When I've had enough, can stand the cold loneliness no longer, release on that very bubble of discovery on which I went down and surface to bring back the bite and sting that bothers us all. Thanks. I've, I've heard there are some refreshments to be had in the middle room back there, and even further along the way are books to be had. So uh, thank you very much for listening and coming tonight. Yeah? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and where you got your origins for creativity? Hmm, there's a long, there are biographical pieces on, on my website and so forth, but um, I grew up in central Massachusetts. Um, I, I uh, came from the town of Lemonster, where there are two pieces of fame. Uh, that's where plastics were invented. And it's also where Johnny Appleseed was born. So I love the idea that both the natural thing, Johnny Appleseed, you know, dispersing apples broadside with a generous hand across the eastern part of the United States, and plastic, that space age material, both from Lemonster. I left it as fast as I could. And I, I came to the University of Vermont um, undergrad. I was a pre-med student, and somewhere in the midst of it, you know, I had this kind of transformative uh, moment, staring at a periodic table, um, and I just saw poems on, you know, superimposed. So I determined to change my major, and so so on and so forth. But that's um, how I started out. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, real life. Um, <laughs> really happened, or you imagined all this? Uh, yeah, as, as the uh, as one person asked Robert Creeley, the poet, are those is that a real poem, or did you just make that up? But no, this is a little bit of a different question. Um, I guess you know you start if you start at all with autobiography. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know many writers who stick obsessively to the facts. You know what you do is, and so. So even, right, even about the Johnson home and so forth, or my incapacity with a, a wrench or, you know, a, a hinge, um, some of that's invented, oh. um, okay. and some of it's Good. true, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> if I could tag on, I would say, because um, narrative stories is kind of how I work uh, also, and people often ask, is that, is that, does that really happen? And I answer that poem is not a photograph. It's, the yeah. on, you know, it's got to be drawn from all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're trying to make you know these things into pieces. At least I am. It's a sense that you're trying to make it into something that uh, is artful, and that sometimes you know the pieces of a of, of an autobiography don't really work well. Uh -huh. in that venture, so you might invent something else, you know, the, the lie that tells the greater truth kind of right. thing, so. Um, you could, yeah. could say a metaphor doesn't exist in life. <laughs> it exists in the poem. Yeah, yeah. There are no exactly. metaphors in life. Right, everything is a literal fact. I have a question for Peggy. Yes. Um, the poem about the Kian River, all those uh, rooms looking out, and all the poets over the years who have stayed in those rooms, there must be hundreds of poems, perhaps, uh, about the river, right? That's, you know a great, the other? that's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, okay. I actually, I was going to say, I have meant to, and I will do it now, because I'm you know, bothered again, I haven't yet. Um, I'm going to give it as a gift and uh, put it in a frame and let them hang it in Maverick, which is the studio. But I haven't ever. I mean, people, the only thing that I ever heard about Eon from anybody was that there were minks yeah. running around yeah. there. And I didn't believe it. There's others. And there's 
doctors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, you know. I, I have no idea, but you know, people do, when I used to direct a place, people did write uh, poems and then, or stories, and then if they had to do with Johnson, Vermont, they sent them back to us oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And I know that it happens a lot in our colonies where they receive, you know, and yeah. it ends up hundreds of pieces about, you know, people staying there. Yeah. Um, I, so Ryan Walsh or Gary Clark, who wants to go run yeah. it, probably would know better how many, you know, Guy Hong or Gi Hong uh, poems there are. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Well, please join us in this way. Thanks a lot.